Bienvenue encore. Une... Welcome back to the uh, World Forum for the uh, Circular Economy. I am uh, Chuck Odenigo, and uh, my colleague and I will be your MCs uh, for the, our talk on uh, the circular economy. Coming up is called Plastic Talks, debating game changers for a circular plastics economy. We have two debates for you on how to realize the biggest impact in accelerating the transition to a circular economy. And given the magnitude of the plastic waste problem, we want to focus on what can we accomplish in the next five years. We're tending to use that little frame from this morning. We're going to steal that and pull that along through the conference. Donc, afin de vous donner un aperçu de la... So to give you an uh, overview of uh, the problem, Tout d'abord, à l'échelle mondiale, entre 24... To give you a, an idea of the size of the problem, uh, 24 to uh, 34 million metric tons of plastic uh, were uh, put into our oceans, lakes, and rivers. Uh, this waste is having a negative impact on 800 uh, ma marine species, including the 90% of seabirds and 50% of turtles who have ingested plastic. IT Upton estimated 2.5 trillion annually in ecological, economic, and social impacts. Um, et à travers les impacts socio-écologiques et économiques, les déchets plastiques pèsent lourd sur nos sociétés. On voit un coût estimé de 2,500... This is a very heavy burden on our society. ...source of greenhouse gases as well. At current rates, plastic-related emissions are equivalent to the emissions of more than 295 new... 500 megawatt coal-fired power plants. Think about that for a second. It's massive. And as we've all witnessed, the pandemic, the COVID pandemic, has only increased plastic use, waste, and litter as all of us, us mask up and try to wash our hands and, and keep each other safe. Alors, quelle est la solution? Nous sommes ici. So what's the solution? And we're here to find out, uh, to start, uh, uh, the use of uh, uh, plastic uh, is... Uh, a, a challenge. Uh, this is a terrible uh, legacy to leave to future generations. Let's uh, welcome uh, the Minister of Environment and Strategy Against Climate Change from uh, British Columbia, who will give us a talk on uh, some measures adopted by British Columbia uh, to deal with the problem of uh, waste. George Heyman, Minister of Environment and Climate Change Strategy for British Columbia, Canada. And I'm joining you from the traditional territories of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh peoples in Vancouver. I want to begin by congratulating the organizers and hosts of the World Circular Economy Forum 2021. British Columbians have been working together for 50 years, trying to build a better way to deal with waste. We started in 1971 when BC was the first jurisdiction in North America to implement a deposit refund system for beverage containers. We then went on to develop a recycling system, which includes producers taking full responsibility for the products they create through extended producer responsibility, or EPR. EPR applies to hundreds of everyday products and packaging, including paint, tires, electronic goods, and just recently, we've targeted for future inclusion EV batteries, mattresses, and moderately hazardous materials. Our next step will include commercial and industrial packaging. There's a great opportunity to get these products out of the waste stream and also uh, to enhance recycling efforts in the interior and north of our province with lower population centers. Here are a few of the success measures of our EPR program. 47,000 tons of plastics from bottles, packaging, and electronics collected last year alone. BC's EPR programs generate an estimated $500 million annually to operate recycling programs and the beverage container deposit refund system. Recycling businesses have invested over $45 million in infrastructure to support residential recycling programs for packaging and for paper. The success of the program is founded on partnership. Recent expansions resulted from consultation with Indigenous nations, local governments, producers, environmental non-government organizations, as well as the public. 
The result is our five-year action plan. EPR is just one way. We're reducing waste and supporting the development of a circular economy. Another way that we've recently announced and we're in the process of launching is a ban on single-use plastics. We've enabled through a, a minister's order local government action on single-use plastic bans where they wish to. Our first step was approving their bylaws. Now we're allowing them to uh, pass their own bylaws within certain parameters, for instance, ensuring that issues of accessibility are addressed. The next step will be to change the law so we can impose a province-wide ban on a select number of single-use pro products, which would otherwise become waste. We're also expanding our residential recycling program. Milk and milk alternative containers are being added to the deposit refund system starting in February 2022. Up to 40 million more containers will be added to our system in this way. Expanding the number of single-use products to be recycled through industry-funded residential recycling programs will be a key to ensuring that we continue to be leaders in Canada in developing a circular economy and reducing waste. Another program about which I'm very, very excited, and we were able to implement it as part of our COVID-19 economic recovery plan is our Clean Coast, Clean Waters initiative. We took tour operators who, for obvious reasons, were no longer uh, doing water-based, uh, ocean-based uh, tours uh, during COVID, and they worked with Indigenous and rural communities through this initiative. To date, more than 550 tonnes of marine plastic and other debris has been removed from the outer shores of our coastline, including the iconic Great Bear Rainforest. Most of the debris that was collected can be recycled. Some products can be turned into plastic pellets that can be used to create new products. And we have that remanufacturing plant right here in British Columbia. Taking waste and turning it into source material for new products is a key principle of circularity. And we are seeing some tremendous uh, proposals from uh, fledgling companies who want to build on our plastics remanufacturing capability and industry here in British Columbia. The next phase will be to eliminate the need for plastics in some production by design. So our Clean BC Plastics Action Fund has recently uh, approved nine projects, including turning plastics from old car batteries into new casings, developing artificial intelligence to sort plastics for recycling, supporting local micro recycling facilities, and turning used plastics into new products, supporting the circular economy of plastics, increasing local processing capacity for recycling, and creating, of course, new jobs. Interconnected initiatives are key to supporting the circular economy, and that's why British Columbia works with governments across Canada as part of the Canada Plastics Pact. Industry, government, and nonprofit organizations are collaborating to address plastic waste to keep it in the economy and out of the environment. We have joined as we recognize that this requires working internationally to address this global issue. In conclusion, all of these actions are part of a holistic system. They support a new way of thinking about products and the power of consumers to move producers to see the advantage of taking better care of our planet. Reducing waste, increasing production based on recovered material, and incentivizing a circular supply chain for plastics is key to this effort. Our 50-year journey has only really just begun as we work together to take further actions to reduce waste. We've learned by listening. We've learned by taking action. We feel we have a pretty good record to share, but we always know there's a lot more to learn. I want to thank you all for hosting this conference and being at the conference. I look forward to putting the lessons learned here into action as we work together to end waste and live better on our one shared planet. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Heyman. Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Wherever in the world this finds you, I hope it finds you well. My name is Sarah Brooks. I am a special advisor to the Canada Plastics Pact and senior associate with the Natural Step Canada, and I will be your moderator for this session. 
I'd also like to start by acknowledging the First Nations of the territories uh, where I live. I uh, currently live, work, and play on the unceded territories of the Tanaha, Sinaix, and Silex people um, here in the interior mountains of British Columbia. For this session, I want you to imagine that you, the audience, are tasked with solving the plastic waste problem in your country. You want to present the best solutions, of course, and you know that there are some key pathways, but you're not sure exactly which ones are best given the context in which you find yourself. So some of the pathways that you're aware of, of course, are scaling innovation, such as new circular business models, designing for circularities, new plastic formats and resins, tracking and collection technologies. That's one pathway. Another one is perhaps driving behavior change to help industry and consumers make sustainable decisions on plastics. Another pathway is regulating solutions, working directly with policymakers to do that. And the third one is helping business communities, civil society, and all levels of government implement voluntary agreements. So four pathways, innovation, drive behavior change, voluntary agreements, and regulatory pathways. Which is the best for you, given your context in your country? Before we get started, uh, we're going to bring in some experts to help us figure this out together. Um, but we do want to take a quick poll to see what you, the audience, thinks is the best solution right now. So on your screen, you'll see a poll question. You can go ahead and answer that. And we'll check back in after the debates to see if anything has changed for you. And we'll share the results um, towards the end of the session today. So you can go ahead and answer the poll question there. And also, don't forget to drop your questions and counterpoints as we go into the question and answer tab to the right of your screen. So go ahead and do that. And as you're filling out that poll, I would like to welcome our first two debaters to the stage here. So arguing for unleashing the power of innovation, we have Usman Valiente. And Usman is, among other things, a wonderful technical advisor to us at the Canada Plastics Pact arguing that we should instead, instead of focusing on innovation, we should be focusing primarily on behavior change. We have Rachel Gray, and Rachel Gray is the behavior change manager at RAP UK. Welcome to you both. Okay, debate debaters, get ready. Um, you each will have three minutes to make your case. And at the end of your time, you will hear this charming sound. And that means your time is up. You'll also have a countdown, so you'll see, but we'll have both those, both those to remind you when we hit the end of our time. Once you have both stated your case, we're going to go straight into our second debate where we'll hear from two more experts, and then we'll turn back to you, the audience, for questions, counter arguments, and also to see if your perspective on this issue has changed at all. So um, we're going to come to you, Rachel, and please go ahead. Oh, good morning, afternoon, evening. Um, three minutes starting now. Oh, lost two minutes. Um, so in my experience, citizen action or people action is a real special ingredient in, in making a, a behavior change happen in plastics. So the reason I say this, whatever your innovation is, somebody somewhere needs to do something with that innovation or that activity, whether this is at work, on the way to work, at home, shopping, on the way to school, in any of these, people need to do something. So what do I mean by doing? What is a doing thing that we need to do? They need to buy recyclable packaging and recycle it afterwards. It's great to invest in recyclability, but you still need that person to recycle it. You can buy into refill systems, say for food and laundry, um, but it needs to mean not just once. If we're going to offset the carbon um, impacts of creating refill containers and systems, then people need to keep refilling and refilling. They need to do something. And finally, if you're shopping for unpacked goods without any packaging, this needs to be carried out to offset the risk of creating more food waste, for example. So you need behavior change and you need people to do something. So all of these things need to happen to make innovation and other services come to life. So a quick quiz. You can't answer, but I'm going to just give you some questions to think about. Do climate change researchers fly more or less than other researchers? You may have seen this in the news. Do you know what? They fly more. You would have thought that climate change researchers know better than to fly a lot. This is just to illustrate that awareness and education is not 
the main ingredient to behavior change. It can be, but there's lots of other things we need to do in behavior change. Particularly in plastics, we have been telling people for a while they're a problem. Something else needs to happen to make the behavior change happen, and that's other techniques. Another question, does a policy change, such as a tax or a charge on carrier bags, work? Yes and no, the answer is yes. In the UK, there was um, a charge put on carrier bags and we did see usage go down. But what we also saw was life. People forget to take their bags when they go shopping and hence kept, kept buying bags for life or thicker carrier bags. And hence, you know, there are less single use bags, but more heavier bags. So it did work partly. And finally, did you know that when people create paths in parks, okay, not a plastic, you, you will see those little muddy paths going off to the side. In the UK, they're muddy because it rains. People don't follow the normal paths. They take their own paths. Why is that? Because choice and creating your own way is bred into us. I want to do it my way. So you can have policy and you can have innovation, but you want behavior change as well. So what can you do? I've mentioned awareness and education. Yes, it's an important part of creating behavior change, but there's lots of other things you need to build in. You can use things like capability. Do people have the ability to do it? Do they have the opportunity? Can they actually do it? And do they have the motivation? And that can be logical plans and goals to emotions and impulses. So how can you actually get people to change behavior all of those things have to come together. You need to invest in behavior change as well as investing in innovation. So let me give you an example. Have I got time? Yes. Um, so just, Sarah? I think so. Let's let's see if we the can. The count has gone a bit seconds. strange. Uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> the counter keeps keep changing. So let's go 20 seconds if we can. 20 seconds. Okay. Thank Tell you. me when. Um, so let's take refill. Let's take refill in store. It's becoming quite a thing to do, particularly with the younger age group. Refilling your laundry, refilling your dry goods like pasta and rice, refilling water. It's one of those things that's starting to gain momentum, but we want it to become mainstream. What will it take to become mainstream. It will take mainstream behavior change to move beyond the early adopters to the everyday shoppers. We know how... Okay, finished. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Rachel. That's great. And Usman, we'll come to you. Your three minutes starts now. Great. Thank you. Um, I think, I think before we talk about innovation, I think it's important to define what innovation is. Um, innovation is the commercialization of applied science or technology. And I believe that innovation is the linchpin to uh, solving the plastic waste problem uh, and optimizing the use of plastics, reducing greenhouse gases, um, and actually driving economic growth in the petrochemical sector on a new tra trajectory towards a circular economy. Um, and innovation with regards to plastics can occur with, with reuse, better systems for um, consolidating, transferring, refurbishing, uh, sterilizing and reusing containers, and in recycling where we're seeing advanced recycling technologies that are coming that can break down plastics into their constituent chemicals or uh, their constituent chemical building blocks, uh, which then get used to remanufacture plastics. And so these technologies for a, techn a technology to go from a technology to an innovation requires uh, two things. One, the technology needs to be viable in solving the problem. And the second thing is that you need to have the right economic conditions for it to flourish. And so those economic conditions for plastics would be, if I'm a recycler of plastics, I need feedstock of material that I can recycle uh, in my technology, and I need demand for that material once I've recycled it to go back into, into plastic containing products or packaging. And that's a behavior change. So, you know, innovation doesn't exist independent of it. And the thing that drives behavior change, um, that's going to drive behavior change in this place and drive innovation is going to be industrial policy. And that industrial policy are policies such as uh, extended producer responsibility, which is going to hold manufacturers responsible for driving innovation. That is implementing uh, technologies that are going to result in better sorting of plastics, better recycling of plastics, implementation of reusable systems, and on the back end, uh, 
what's going to drive innovation is going to be the demand for that recycled content that's going to go into the next cycle of production. And I believe that innovation is really the linchpin here and everything else we do needs to be to create an environment where people are willing to take bench scale technologies, test them out, find, find what they're doing wrong, learn by doing, and then continue to iterate forward until we get technologies that are applied in a way that can actually result in the outcomes that we're looking for, which is a waste-free, and that includes greenhouse gas-free circular economy. And that innovation really is going to come from a focused industrial policy, which is going to drive behavior change in what we operate in, which is a market economy. And so, uh, you know, I would contend that we need to focus on innovation as the, the pathway to a circular economy for plastics. Thank you, Usman. That's perfect. It sounds like we have a real debate on our hands. So thank you to you both very much. Time's up for this debate, but not to worry. We have more and we will get a chance to have question and answer with all our debaters as well. So next we are tackling that age old question, regulation or voluntary agreements. All right, here we go. So whether we think we should be focusing our efforts on driving new innovations to solve our plastic waste problem, or whether you're convinced that the biggest impact will happen when people change their behavior, we're going to check in on this. So we're, we're working with Elizabeth Balkan, Director of Reloop Americas, an NGO focused on advancing circular packaging, and Lena Kaisa Piakari, Senior Specialist at the Ministry of Environment in Finland. Elizabeth, you're up first. Your three minutes starts now. Thank you. A joke common in the Soviet Union went, we pretend to work and they pretend to pay us. The same can be said for recycling for much of the last 30 years. We pretend recycling works and producers pretend to take responsibility. For decades, valuable commodities were spirited away, sometimes buried or burned, often exported with a closed loop recycling a rarity. The system was not broken so long as you wished it otherwise. We're no longer able to ignore system deficiencies made apparent by the plastic crisis, whose markers have become too familiar and too close. Images of wildlife strangled by straws, picturesque beaches malformed by litter. The stinging fact that without targeted industry regulation, less than 8% of plastics are effectively recycled globally. There's a lot of fanfare and optimism in sweeping announcements on voluntary commitments. Unfortunately, we have seen what often happens with voluntary yet unrealistic goals. Take as example, TerraCycle, who among us didn't want to love their promise to deliver near magical solutions to companies seeking bold, but ultimately voluntary action. Eventually the fantasy was laid bare with revelations of promises broken. Solving the class plastic crisis won't be easy. The skeptics are right to question the fitness and sincerity of governments acting in this regard. But the decision we face is an easy one. Simply put, a world without regulation got us where we are today and enhanced regulations are essential to find our way out of this mess. The good news is that we have several well-defined and tested tools to conquer the plastics problem. First, extended producer responsibility. EPR imposes a recycling quota on producers for specific packaging or products. Most OECD member states have adopted EPR for packaging along with increasing swaths of Asia and Latin America. Even the United States is now pursuing EPR policies. Nearly a quarter century of experience with EPR means we have vast system performance data from which to glean lessons and derive principles. Second, minimum recycle content mandates. This intervention increases demand for recyclable material irrespective of the price of virgin material. Recycle content mandates come with a strong climate link. Recycling saves 88% of energy for plastic compared with manufacturing raw material. In fact, WCEF co-host Citra have estimated that raising recycling rates for plastic, aluminum, and glass by 50 to 80 percent would cut European emissions, industrial emissions, by a third. Finally, container deposit systems, as we heard from Minister Heyman. In many parts of Europe, these systems capture well over 95 percent of the glass, aluminum, and plastic beverage containers sold. More impressive still is the correlation between high-functioning deposit systems and a robust market for refillable containers, the ultimate solution to single-use plastics. The above tools are designed for measurable impact with well-honed mechanisms to ensure transparency and accountability. Sorry. 
In contrast, we see a long trail of voluntary and broken promises. Accelerating the transition to a circular economy demands enabling regulatory mechanisms. Let's start by telling the truth about a broken system so we can get to work to fix it. Thank you, Elizabeth. Some, the, the debate is heating up. Lena, we'll come to you and your three minutes starts now. Uh, bonjour, mes amis de l'économie. Good morning, friends of the circular economy. On the other side of the screens, uh, I want to today convince you all that voluntary based mechanisms can be very powerful in battling against challenges such as the climate change or loss of biodiversity or overconsumption of natural resources. And here in Finland, we have a lot of good experiences with so far eight national voluntary Green Deal agreements negotiated between the government government, cities and business sectors. Uh, companies bring their own share by joining the mechanism and making their own voluntary commitments to common targets and actions. We have received our first encouraging results and keep on developing our dreams. Uh, our newest deal, Construction Plastics, is a great example of the strengths of our deals. With this deal, we were able to engage the whole value chain concerning the use of plastic films in Finnish construction to common targets and actions. This would have been very challenging through legislation. To make the change happen, we need to increase the sorting of plastic films. We need to prepare plastic films for recycling. We have engaged the plastic industry to use this raw material in their production so that until uh, 2027, 40% of all raw materials in their production will be recycled materials. We also need to boost the demand for recycled construction plastic the overall use of plastic films will be optimized and decreased. Cities can support these goals through their procurements. And all of this we have done in our single one green deal. We will update the goals along the way and monitor how the deal works. If needed, we will make changes to how we operate. Another great example of our mechanism is the common understanding of challenges and required actions through the whole value chain that we gain through negotiating the deal together. Different parties put a lot of effort and time in planning and are thus very comment, committed to implement it in action. The system gives more freedom to find innovative, new and the most suitable practices and solutions from the companies and cities' perspectives. At the same time, Green Deals bring companies and cities positive image. They offer concrete tools to meet their own sustainability targets. Deals support innovativeness, making companies and cities forerunners in sustainability. We really truly believe that this is a game-changing concept. With careful planning, voluntary agreements are a great addition to policy tool mix, and we want to circulate our experiences. So please be in touch, and I want to give us our, our experiences from our deals. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Lena. Okay, so we're going to bring back um, Rachel and Usman. Welcome back to all our debaters. Thank you very much. It's good fun to have a, a little bit of a heated discussion. Um, and before we debrief, now that um, you, the audience, have heard four different points of view on key pathways to achieve a circular plastics packaging economy, um, we're going to do a second temperature check on the poll. So we're, you'll see that poll come up. You can go ahead and answer that as we get ready to move into our question and answer. And we will show you the results of that very shortly. So you can go ahead um, and just respond to the Slido poll. Now, as we uh, get into our questions here, I'm going to uh, thank you for those that have submitted. You're welcome to continue to submit your questions on the Q&A tab um, and go ahead and upvote those questions that you also would like very much to hear back from. So our first question, Usman, I'm going to come to you first um, to respond to this and we'll see if other members of our debating team would like to ring in as well. So we talked about four key pathways to achieve a circular plastics packaging economy. And one, one of the questions is, what about a fifth way? So we've talked a lot about plastics, what we can do to innovate around plastics, plastics infrastructure, business models, and so on. But what about alternative materials that can substitute for plastics? And where did they come in in the transition to circularity? So Usman, we'll come to you first. 
Sure. I mean, um, you know, we can look at material substitutes. I mean, within plastics itself, a substitute for fossil-based plastics are bio-based plastics. And then the question becomes, how are those recirculated? How do those either become biological nutrients or how are they then recycled in our traditional recycling system so that the energy that's input into them is, is retained and they're not converted to greenhouse gases and, and we minimize waste. So, you know, irrespective of what material we choose, the, the principles are the same. If you switch from a plastic bottle to an aluminum can, there's embodied energy and emissions in that aluminum. The problem doesn't change. So just transposing materials doesn't work. You need to build systems that recirculate materials irrespective of what material you choose. And in some cases, you may completely dematerialize a system, or not completely, but largely dematerialize a system by converting a product to a service, or in the case of reuse, amortizing uh, the initial cost to make a container over dozens and dozens of reuses. So we have to look at system optimization, but if the in right incentives are in place, then we get the market to start to weigh those alternatives and optimize for them. Right now, the choices are unsubsidized, so, so we're not looking at what, how we can substitute linear systems for circular ones or what material choices we might make alternative to what we're doing today. Thank you. Um, who else would like to ring in on that? Okay. Well, oh, yes, Rachel, please go ahead. Um, so when material alternatives are being um, considered, I think if you put the citizen at the heart of that choice, already we're facing quite difficult decisions. So I'm walking down the street with my container and I'm not quite sure what it is and I'm not quite sure what to do with it. So you're adding another question and we know already with um, bio-based plastics or compostable plastics, there is confusion about what people do to them in what context. So it's not just the material, it's the material that the context it's used in as well. And I would say, yes, a bit of material alternatives, but make it easy and simple for citizens understand what they've got to do. Um, keep it simple. Thank you. Elizabeth, I saw that you had unmuted yourself. Did you have something you wanted to add? No? Okay. Um, the next question I'll come, actually, Elizabeth, I'll come to you first, and then Lena, I'd like to come to you after that as well. So the question is, how do we incentivize the countries that are oil exporters and big oil to stop investing in cheap single-use plastics and mass production and instead reduce their production and make it more sustainable? So how do we do that, and is it possible? What are the mechanisms to do that? So Elizabeth, and then Lena, will come to you after that. Uh, that's a great question. I think that um, the response is, is, a, is a complicated one. Um, and of course, I'm arguing on the side of, of regulation. Um, ultimately, there needs to be a culture shift um, and there needs to be a new value proposition that makes it appealing to those companies, um, whether they're shifting their portfolio to renewables or investing in other climate neutral solutions. There has to be some skin in the game for them as far as a profit opportunity um, and new market expansion. So I think that goes hand in hand with regulation. Um, but at the end of the day, I think we've seen that um, holding, uh, expecting that these kinds of petrochemical companies will make this shift without being pushed or without being their feet held to the fire um, just hasn't materialized. So we cannot just um, wait for the circular economy to materialize until they say, oh, this sounds like a good idea. Um, it has to be a combination and there has to be some understanding that without that shift, there will be penalties. I think that goes very hand in hand as well with incentivizing and rewarding the companies that are taking early action, uh, whether it be uh, renewable companies uh, or other uh, producers, you know, who are doing the right thing. Uh, let's let's give them uh, an extra um, a head start in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of how we how we reward them uh, financially and in terms of um, the law. Thank you. Lena. Um, I would say that uh, uh, the voluntary mechanism could work in a way that it gives the, the industries and the business sectors themselves more flexibility in thinking what are the new ways of uh, 
doing, what are the new business potential, and and in 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 that way incentivize them to to uh, do it from there. But of course, we always then have the the other choice of legislation and and this if the voluntary mechanisms don't work. But I think the, this innovativeness, flexibility, uh, kind of to give more uh, for the industry to themselves think how it could be done are the strengths from the voluntary side. Thank you very much. Um, we have another question here about the balance between behavior change and policy change. So we'll come, um, we'll start with you, Rachel, here. So long-term experience shows, and this is from the audience, that governments are very slow with adapting policy, and once changed, policy is difficult to change again. How do we find the best balance between behavior change, so bottom-up change, and policy change, which is top-down? Rachel, we'll come to you first, and then um, Usman, I'm going to ask you to ring in on this one as well. I think the balance is to have both, um, which doesn't really give you one side or the other, but I think policy change can happen. Of course, governments can make their decisions, but policy change won't happen on the ground until people do something. So people need to do something because they're being asked to from government or people need to do something for whatever motivation they feel is right. So I think there is a balance of top down and bottom up, if you want to describe it that way, to bring them together. And in some examples, um, the recent debate on plastics is driving policy change. It wouldn't have happened if people didn't start thinking about plastics, who started complaining about plastics, who started to say to retailers and brands, I don't want this this way um, to government. So the two come together. But I think the citizen is ultimately the person that has to do something to make the change. And they should be at the center of the change in whatever form that takes. Thank you. Usman, reflections on that? And then Elizabeth, I'll come to you as well. Yeah, I think as science and you, you know uncovers the problems with plastics in the environment, I you know I agree with I, I agree with Rachel. Like I think the, the next thing that happens is the citizenry gets motivated, and then policymakers uh, decide to act. And the question becomes: when policymakers decide to act, and they sort of embody our moral sentiments in the law, the the law then is designed to incentivize behavior at scale. So we would want to change systems at scale using the law. And the question becomes, what are the best laws um, th that you can you can implement that uh, incentivize markets towards innovation, um, incentivize and bring uh, all the other systems, business systems along to address the problem. And, and so that's the, you know, the art of regulatory design is how do we get these r rules in place? And typically what you find is the simplest rules um, ones that are uh, regulable and administrable and understandable and set the right economic incentives are the most durable policies you can have. And so, you know, this is where we, you need to bring all of these things together is we're actually trying to drive behavior change, we're trying to drive innovation, and what's the design of public policy that gets us there. And so this is a really an art of bringing this all together into a package that, that transforms our systems to a circular economy. Thank you. And Elizabeth, you were arguing for regulatory, so let's uh, <laughs> get on that. Yeah, well, echoing much of what Rachel and Usman said, um, at Reloop, we, we see this transition to a circular economy as being built on effective and responsible policy, which we define as supporting the waste hierarchy, encouraging existing best practices, and fostering innovation applying economic instruments and uh, financial incentives when necessary, um, and striving for continuous improvement. So I think what you see here is a policy approach that in some ways actually sounds more like a free market approach, right? It's innovation, economics, um, you know, and, con and improvement or efficiency. Uh, so again, I think it's, it's helpful not to look at policy or regulation in a monolithic sense, but really see the opportunities to integrate it with these other intervention uh, opportunities. Thanks, Elizabeth. And Lena, I'll come to you on this one. Um, to start with, there's a question here that's been asked and upvoted, which is, what is the balance um, between voluntary and regulatory approaches? How do they work together to advance the circular economy? 
Uh, in Finland, uh, quite often we use, for example, our green deals to supplement the legislation. There are many parts of, uh, of uh, legislation that we find that, that actually the green deals will bring a bit more on top of, top of it and maybe even like uh, put more ambitious goals and targets than we have in regulation. And um, we, we usually really carefully go through through before we start preparing a new deal that is the theme and topic actually something that works we have uh, during the past years really well already learned what kind of topics work in our our deals and on the other side what kind of topics are better to be on the the regulation side but i think they go very well well together and they can truly supplement each other and and bring something new and uh, and uh, something on top top of each other so so I'm not, it's not so much of uh, one against uh, the other, but we need both. Very much. Anybody else want to reflect on that here? We're just, we've got about one minute left here. So I'll, I'll open the floor for reflections. Yeah, I think. Well, I think one thing that's pretty interesting to see is the number of companies that are actually calling for regulation. So this idea that you know, it's regulation versus corporate competitiveness is a little um, misinformed when you see, you know, um, in, in the U.S., the American Beverage Association, um, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation representing 100 corporate signatories um, have all come out with statements calling for EPR in the U.S. Um, there's similar examples from Europe with, with Europen um, calling for amendments to Europe's EPR legislation to make it more transparent, transparent and accountable. Um, so I think for me, what's insightful is that um, this opportunity for regulation to actually establish a level, level playing field actually makes the opportunities for competitiveness and innovation more rich and more readily available. Um, and in that way, it's not sort of pinning industry against public, but how can public policy work to stimulate innovation and foster continued development? Thanks. Thank you very much, Elizabeth and Usman. I know you had something to say. If you can do it in 25 seconds or less, yeah, the floor no, is yours. I, yeah, no, I know. I think Elizabeth uh, nailed it. I, I mean, I think. Um, you know, waste is a collective action problem, and you can volunteer, but find yourself uncompetitive with your competitors. Once you've got public policy saying you've all got to meet a certain performance standard, then you know you can collectively work together and create scale and efficiency to address that problem and so i think there's a role for voluntary instruments but at the scale that we're dealing with the plastic waste problem we need we need scaled public policy that's going to address it on a systemic level and so uh, you know i just strongly agree with all of the comments that came before me on that Thank you very much. Well, before I pass things back to our MCs, let's see what the results of our polls were. So first, let's take a look at the results of the opening poll. So in terms of where should we be investing, um, I don't see the result. I can't actually see the results. Here we go. Very good. Okay, so regulation is seen as a top. This was our first poll. And then behavior change. Okay, so folks, we can see that. And then let's see the results of the second poll. So after we've heard our debaters, did anything change? Okay, so even stronger on, on regulation a little bit, but also a little bit more on innovation. So a bit of a split between innovation and behavior. And I think we can take from that. So thank you very much to the audience for your participation and to our wonderful debaters. And I think one of the things that the difference in this polls that it shows us is that open dialogue and challenging each other's ideas matters. So how we learn is we learn together. So thank you very much to everybody um, who participated both in panel and in the audience. And back to you, Catherine and Chuck. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. And of course, this debate is going to continue well beyond um, the days that we're together this week. But we're going to pick up this thread on Wednesday, and people will have an opportunity to engage with it. Please be sure to tune in to our partners' accelerator sessions if you're interested in learning more about building a circular economy for plastic specifically. Hey, donc. And. I'm uh, excited to uh, be together again for our next uh, session, Circular 360.